much of my childhood, I lived in a house in Huddersfield with six bedrooms. There was a Doric portico with smooth brown steps that led into a large garden of lawns and rhododendrons. The roots of two large horse chestnut trees, one either side of the gate, undermined the lawns, and here and there pushed up the flagstones along the path. The gateposts of thick stone as tall as a man should have said Cora Lynn, one word on either coping stone, but a wagon brushed past them one day, spinning one round. From then on, Lynn faced inwards and Cora stared at the narrow street alone. The whole house had that faded elegance of other days and in sympathy with the rest of Georgian Huddersfield, its ashlar front was jet black like the floor-length dress of the old lady who lived in the tiny gaslit chapel further down the road. It was 1950. Children could not be abused in those days because not to abuse them was abuse in itself. Spare the rod and spoil the child was a universal watchword. We, my brothers and sisters, were abused by being spared. At least that was true at home. School was another matter. On arriving back from school each day, we were given bread and jam and then turned out until dinner time. Children, we were told, should be seen and not heard. The backyard had coach houses, workshops, and a coachman's cottage. It was surrounded by high walls and laid out a badminton court. Beyond were the stable yard and a paddock as big as a small field. We had plenty of place, a safe space to play in. Bit by bit, 1950 ticked its way towards Christmas Eve. The year passes slowly for a child. I was six years old, with three brothers and a cousin who was more like a sister to me. With two of my brothers, one older, one younger, I shared a room that overlooked the grey lead roof of the portico. My eldest brother, ten years older than me, was more like an uncle. At five o'clock in the morning, that cold, frosty Christmas morning, my cousin tapped at our door. Already awake and excited, we hurried into clothes and dressing gowns. As the cold hit me, though, I felt a strong urge to visit the toilet. To do this, I had to turn left, turn right, turn right again, and then left, which would bring me to the short toilet corridor. I had to take this complex journey in almost complete darkness, with just the light that found its way through the half-lit landing window. I turned left, then right, right again, but when I touched the wall in front of me, it just melted away and then closed up again behind me. There were many rooms in that house that I'd never been in. Was I still in the same house, I wondered, or had I stumbled into one of those horror stories my eldest brother told me to frighten us? It was dark, deathly quiet, and it smelt different. Away across at the other side, I could see moonlight creeping around the edge of a tall curtain. I set off towards it, and partway across, I got an awful fear that the floor would open up under my feet and I would fall into yet another unknown room. As I stepped carefully, I brushed against strange furniture and then recoiled in horror as the hands of the curtain wrapped themselves around my face. Goodness gracious, I was scared. I swallowed hard, moved the curtain aside and stared out of the window. The moon shone bright and cheerful like the star over Bethlehem across a grey and frosted garden and there, to my relief, stood Cora and Lynn, shivering under the chestnut trees. I knew then at least I was in the right house. I began to understand what had happened to me. The wall hadn't melted. I must have turned right too soon and come through the door of the bedroom that was next to ours. Confusion cleared and the mist of disorientation drifted away. As best I could, I pulled back the curtain to give some more light, took my bearings from the window and set off back towards the door, but I never made it. Instead, with my hands stretched out in front of me and my pale dressing gown brushing the floor, I walked into something. It was a body. It lay on a bed and was, I realised, still alive because it was quivering. I walked my fingers up its torso onto its face. In a strangled voice, it cried, What is it? I'm lost, I wailed. The body leapt out of my grasp and the light came on. There, terrified and with his back to the wall, stood my eldest brother. Hadn't he woken to see the curtains open and a ghost in the moonlight come in at the window? 
Hadn't it made a beeline for him and explored his features with its icy fingers wailing like a lost soul? <laughs> he was so relieved that it was only me. He let me out without tucking me around the ear and shoved me back onto the landing. Stumbling down the cold, graceful staircase with its enormous stained glass window, I joined the others in the living room where the fire had been banked up the night before to keep us warm. There was a toilet in the hall and I'd used that. I wasn't going to risk the one on the landing again. I can't remember what Father Christmas brought me, but I'm sure it was extra special that year.